Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Stephanie Ince, and I'm thrilled to introduce the My Dystonia and I webinar series that DMRF Canada is hosting in partnership with MERS Therapeutics. The My Dystonia and I webinar series will focus on empowering patients and optimizing patient treatment outcomes. I'm joined by my colleague, Archna Castellino, who's our, new, our newly appointed national director. Archna and I are thrilled to have you with us today. The My Dystonia and I webinar series offers five webinars during the course of September, all in recognition of Dystonia Awareness Month. Each webinar will focus on a specific area of dystonia and will feature a physician from the field. Five separate movement disorder specialists from all over the country will be participating. Next slide, please, Archana. So today, we're pleased to be presenting our fourth webinar in the My Dystonia series designed to help you live well with dystonia. Our topic today is understanding cervical dystonia, and today we're joined by Dr. Rizik. Dr. Rizik completed his neurology residency at Western University and subsequently his clinical fellowship in movement disorders at Western University under the mentorship of Dr. Mandar Jog. He completed his master's degree in anatomy and cell biology at Queen's University. He is a diplomat of the Canadian Society of Clinical Neurophysiologists, Neuro -physio EEG, and completed further neurophysiology training in transcranial magnetic stimulation at Harvard Medical School. He is currently staff neurologist, movement disorders specialist at Credit Valley Hospital, physician lead EEG quality at Trillium Health Partners, neurologist in the Huntington Disease Clinic at North York General Hospital, he is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and investigator at the Institute of Better Health Trillium Health Partners. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Rizik. Uh, just a little housekeeping before we get started. First, a very important reminder that this is a webinar presentation that aims to provide dystonia patients and caregivers with tips and tools on how to live your best life with dystonia. We urge you to speak with your medical doctor or neurologist for a full and complete examination and to remember that you are in control of your own health. A reminder that a recording of this presentation will be made available and emailed out to all of you once it's online. As for questions, as you know, we collected questions upon registration and we have shared these with Dr. Rizik to help him in preparation for his presentation. As well, if questions occur to you during the presentation, we would encourage you to type those questions into the Q&A section, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. My colleague Archna will be monitoring these questions throughout the presentation and we, they will bring she will bring these questions to Dr. Rizik um, upon the completion of his presentation. Finally, there is a chat function, um, so you should be able to um, type in the chat function to say hi to all of your colleagues, and we look forward to a wonderful presentation. And for now, I will turn things over to Dr. Rizik. Thank you for that introduction, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us and taking time out of your busy day to join us. Let me see how I can share my screen right here. Um, yes, stop other screen sharing. Thank you for those slides as well. Okay, so we're gonna talk about um, one of the most common focal uh, forms of dystonia. I'll explain that in a little, little bit more detail known as cervical dystonia. Um, let me move forward through my slides here. Are you able to see that okay? Archana or uh, Stephanie, if you can confirm. Yes, Dr. Rizek. Thank you. Um, I hope you've been able to enjoy some of the other talks uh, by my colleagues as part of this Dystonia webinar series. Today, we're going to uh, provide you with a uh, presentation to introduce cervical dystonia. Um, those of you that may be joining us may be very familiar with this condition and suffering from it, and hopefully uh, we can provide a few uh, pearls and uh, um, discussion on optimizing treatment, the concept of treatment failures and why that may be. Uh, and where to go thereafter. A botulinum toxin uh, injection treatment, which is the first line therapy, uh, the concept of using guided assistance in these injections, and some of the non-motor symptoms uh, it, uh, that are associated with cervical dystonia. I do have to um, go over my disclosures and conflicts of interest, which I've presented here, organizations that have funded uh, research or positions I've held in consultancy roles that may or may not be relevant to this talk. So 
dystonia is, uh, the term dystonia has probably been reviewed with many of you who've been uh, uh, attending the prior talks. It was first uh, coined uh, by Oppenheim in 1911, uh, derived from the word dis or abnormal or disordered antonia, meaning uh, tone or tonicity. Uh, Non-motor symptoms are becoming increasingly important for optimal treatment, and that's something I'm going to bring up specifically with cervical dystonia today. Um, any body part can be affected in dystonia. Uh, we're going to focus on a focal dystonia known as cervical dystonia, which is the most common form affecting the, the, the neck musculature. Uh, Non-motor symptoms are those that are not related to movement, such as fatigue, depression, and pain. The, uh, this slide is to show you the prevalence of primary dystonia. Uh, as a whole, uh, primary dystonia, either we, um, it's not caused by uh, another condition, another underlying degenerative process, such as uh, degenerative disease like Parkinson's disease, or it's not secondary to a medication side effect, like a neuroleptic medication. Uh, cervical dystonia and blepharospasm itself, if you look at those numbers, are account for about four to five per 100,000 each. So those are the two most common forms of focal dystonia. The most common form of focal dystonia is cervical dystonia and there are various types of patterns of how it affects the neck and neck positioning. Um, it is, the, the cervical dystonia itself is not just a problem with the uh, spine or the uh, posture of the neck. It has to do with an abnormal signal from the brain, a problem with the software communicating with how the neck positions themselves. So it's a, a, a signal uh, a, a problem, which I'll go into more detail in a second, leading the muscles to be overactive and putting them into a, um, an abnormal posture. Uh, the neck can be either uh, a lateral collis, which is a tilt to one side, a torticollis, which is the most common where the neck pulls away from the midline or in it, what we would call a turned position. Enterocollis causes the head to be pulled forward and is caused by abnormal activity in the muscles at the front of the neck. Retrocollis causes the head to be pulled backwards. There are head postures which are similar to the above, uh, but can, can be from the base of the skull uh, upward and may not involve uh, the neck itself. But a slight tilt towards the shoulder is a lateral caplet a torti caput is where the head is pulled back and slightly rotated to one side uh, without hyperextension of the neck per se. Uh, and similar in the anterior and posterior direction, this chin tuck position is the antero caput and the head slightly tilted backwards is the retro caput. The most common being torticollis. And I do want to point out most patients will present with a combination of these postures. Cervical dystonia's prevalence, I, we, we've talked about I, I, reporting it as 20 to 4,100 cases per million uh, is uh, in, in the literature as a, a, a global epidemiological number is probably easier to just give the number of about five cases per 100,000. In the movement disorder world, we actually see this commonly because they tend to be filtered to our clinics uh, for management and, uh, and the correct diagnosis as well. The mean age of onset of primary cervical dystonia is about 42 years of age, and certainly that can range. Um, if the, it's slightly more predominant in women, but certainly it does occur in men. It's about a two to one ratio. Uh, less than 1% may remit spontaneously, unless it's acute or post-traumatic rather than a delayed post-traumatic where remission can be higher. We'll talk about some risk factors in a second in developing cervical dystonia. Um, sometimes we don't always have the cause, uh, but there may be a, an underlying susceptibility in the patients who develop this. Family history can occur in about 10%. There's some reports that say 10 to 25%, and there are a few genes that have been identified with this, but we don't know all of the genes that, are, that cause cervical dystonia. Um, the uh, pain can be a, a common thing in about 75%, and so this can certainly affect quality of life. Let's, let's go back to, to, to genetics. Please note that many of these genes listed here are um, only tested for in a research setting and require a ref uh, referral to a geneticist or genetics counselor. They are not commonly ordered or requested by your neurologist. Note also that the known genes, 
uh, above have also been identified in a minority of cases of the patients with a reported family history. And this is why genetic testing is not a routine recommendation uh, for patients with cervical dystonia. The majority of cases are idiopathic. And, and the idiopathic cases that might not be related to, do, uh, to uh, you know, an identifiable uh, cause, a gene that we know, or trauma, um, it might actually be uh, a genetic in the background. We just not, have not discovered what the underlying cause. There might be some environmental factors as well that may play a role. What we do know are some of the uh, uh, risk factors, the, inf uh, the influencing factors. We talked about uh, uh, females, more than, uh, females being more, uh, more affected than males slightly, a predisposition, which might be that underlying genetic susceptibility. And that might be the key to understanding the pathophysiology of dystonia, uh, indicated by the uh, non-motor abnormalities that are found in unaffected first degree relatives. So what that means is you might have a family member who does not have the dystonia, uh, but they might have um, uh, other uh, uh, non-motor symptoms that may be seen and uh, that may also be common in the person with dystonia and, and might tell you that uh, uh, looking at the non-motor components such as um, uh, uh, presence of other factors that might put them at risk, repetitive activity, trauma, emotional distress that may predispose them to developing the physical symptom which is the cervical dystonia. Um, we talked about traumatic injury uh, to the head or face area, extreme repetitive use of certain muscle groups. Uh, we talked about that might be again related to the susceptibility um, the repetitive use concept in dystonia, where there's a, a software problem to fine tune movement, the signal to the group of muscles in order to perform a specific task, uh, in the case of cervical dystonia, to keep your head in a central neutral position, um, and uh, you know, repetitively, just by, uh, let's say, something you do uh, uh, occupationally, uh, might put you into a certain position that might change the wiring in terms of telling the signal between what is neutral position uh, versus what is the true central position and how it moves, it might be uh, might explain some of this. However, we don't have a good explanation to that, uh, unlike uh, 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 what we suspect in task-specific dystonias, such as writer's cramp, which is a form of focal dystonia, as an example. Acquired cervical dystonia is rare. Uh, and can uh, arise after exposure to anti-dopaminergic drugs, blood, drugs that block dopamine, neuroleptic medications, such as antipsychotic medications, or um, uh, uh, anti-nausea medications that do cross into the brain, uh, brain injury, and other neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson disease. Uh, estimates of the total uh, uh, prevalence of dystonia may underrepresent the true prevalence because, under, because of underdiagnosis or misdiagnosis. I want to show you a video just to get it, which will um, highlight a few points that I've already mentioned. And my understanding is I have to stop sharing my PowerPoint presentation and share just the video to get it to work correctly. So let's do that right now. Let me know if you don't see the video, Arshna. So I'll give you a minute to look at this person. This is a YouTube video from a person who documents his journey with cervical dystonia. Full disclosure, I do not know this person, but do appreciate making these videos uh, publicly available. Uh, complex movement in some patients with, uh, this highlights complex movements in some patients with cervical dystonia with multiple direction of movements. There may be a superimposed head tremor that you can see. The head tremor might be compensatory though. So unlike a primary tremor syndrome, uh, like e an essential tremor, where the head shakes back and forth in a no-do direction equally left and right, um, this may be compensatory as he's trying to look back at the screen, but the primary direction of dystonia is focusing his, he focusing his head back uh, um, into what the brain thinks is the neutral position. Uh, and there's an incorrect signal by the software. Uh, and uh, there may be a sensory uh, component where his head is in space, what's called proprioception. Motor integration problem, the motor program the signal to the muscles of the neck to keep his head in the correct desired position. So he wants to look straight at the screen, but his head thinks the neutral position in his case would be a turn to the right and a tilt to the left with some backwards pulling. So as he tries to go back in a neutral position, the tremor comes out worse as his muscles are trying to force him back into the abnormal position. So I'm gonna stop that video. And bring you back to the presentation.
And so we do appreciate with that example, the functional limitations observed in patients with cervical dystonia, uh, the decrease in uh, movement amplitude of his neck where he wants to look, difficulty to read, to drive, to watch television, to look at a computer screen, and there's also social isolation uh, that's associated with this. There are a number of symptoms often associated with cervical dystonia. So general pain up to 91%. Cervical pain is very pronounced, 75%. So pain in those neck muscles. If you think about there's an abnormal signal that causes those muscles to be overactive, certainly if you can't relax those muscles, they will be uh, tonically contracted. We talked about that, that definition. And so they will be painful. Imagine holding a, a, a weight in your arm and to contract your bicep and not being able to let it go that would cause pain. We have the advantage when we're lifting a weight or a heavy grocery bag that we can let it go once our arm starts to fatigue. In this case, it's constantly active. Uh, the head tremor does occur in 65%, which is not an insignificant number. Headache can be 56%. And hand tremor can occur in 23 to 27%. Uh, the hand tremor uh, tends to uh, uh, occur after the onset of the cervical dystonia, but certainly can co-occur. In the cases where hand tremor may present before a head tremor, you have to think of something called essential tremor. But it would be very unusual to have the head tremor first, and that's why it's good to speak to a neurologist about the possibility. Is it really essential tremor that you know, another doctor may have told you about, or is this a dystonic neck tremor? That might be the early stages of cervical dystonia because they're treated differently. They both, progress, they both may progress slowly uh, over years. Um, in some studies, in up to 32% of patients, although it's focal in the neck, some patients can have cervically innervated muscles. What does that mean? That means uh, areas nearby that can also be affected. So, so a hand maybe on one side as well, that might have a dystonia or dystonic tremor, the jaw muscles, uh, that which, is, which, is, uh, which may be related or associated in a number of patients. In one study, the occurrence of head tremor in their sample was about 38%. And uh, the occurrence of postural hand tremor um, in the patient with the head tremor was, uh, uh, was higher than those with the cervical dystonia without the head tremor that just had the pulling in one direction. So the diagnosis is, 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 is key because it is clinical and thus getting the, uh, the correct diagnosis is important. Um, other neurological problems can mimic torticollis, which is a neck twist or neck turn. You might have heard the term of torticollis. And the practitioner should be alert to a history of a, a, a number of things um, that can cause your head to move or twitch. Uh, a, a, um, a, a thing that neurologists will also look at is doing a head to toe exam to make, make sure there are not any associated symptoms. But what could cause your head to tilt in the absence of other neurological symptoms? Uh, no stiffness, slowness of Parkinsonism, no weakness, numbness, no changes in your speech, but purely a head tilt. Well, looking at the eye movements, uh, to, because some people who have an eye muscle coordination abnormality where one eye doesn't move to the same um, degree as the other in a coordinated fashion, can cut, which can cause double vision, in, in some patients they will tilt their head to compensate. So it's, that would be easier to sort out in a, neuro, a neurological examination because you can have them uh, adjust their head to tilt against uh, their compensatory direction and seeing if you can bring up the double vision and then check the eye movements. Uh, that is something that can occur in children with a condition called congenital nystagmus. It can occur um, in, in teens once you start to notice uh, or uh, a, a head tilt that might be also be congenital but doesn't emerge till later. It can be re-emergent in adulthood if there was any head injury as well, but that might trace back to childhood. Um, and it could also happen to, uh, uh, it, it, after people get uh, uh, an injury to one of the areas of the brain that might coordinate the eye muscles. It can happen with inner ear disease where patients can have disequilibrium of balance, the la labyrinth of the inner ear or the what's called the vestibular apparatus, and that can cause their head to tilt as well. In children, it's not as straightforward. So children don't tend to get primary cervical dystonia. Uh, uh, remember we mentioned the mean age was 42 years of age. Um, so you might want to look at the uh, head to toe uh, or, uh, and, and if, even if that's normal, follow them up over time for the development of other symptoms 
and especially if they're infants, seeing the developmental stages, make sure it's not part of a generalized dystonia. If you do determine their head movement is a dystonia. Um, the, uh, uh, there are other conditions that can cause their head to tilt that are a bit more benign. Uh, congenital muscular torticollis is a rare congenital muscle problem with the, one of the muscles of the side of the neck that, get, that swells initially, then shortens and, gets, uh, sh and, and causes their head to tilt. It's in, sometimes it can be treated um, conservatively and they can do well after their first year of life, but some patients might need surgery to correct that shortened muscle, which that is, again, not a dystonia, but it can look very similar. Uh, another cause of tilting the head in, in children and infants uh, that can look very similar, especially infants, are those with uh, GERD or acid reflux associated torticollis. They tend to arch their head with the acid reflux, and the primary treatment of that is to treat the acid reflux. That's actually not uncommon uh, in terms of, the, uh, of all the patients we see with torticollis. I'm not a pediatric neurologist, but in that world, that is quite common. Uh, there's, a, there's a rare variant of migraine in babies in, in early childhood uh, that's called benign paroxysmal torticollis uh, that can occur with um, uh, uh, tilting of the head, with side twitching between attacks. They tend to occur within a predictable pattern, so occurring monthly. Um, in, in, uh, in children and, and, and kids with, uh, it, sorry, in children and uh, um, young adult and uh, teens, uh, who have uh, this, uh, there are medications that can be tried. And in, in very uh, in young children and infants, metabolic workup is also important because there are mechanism specific treatments that we can address. And of course, you can certainly use botulinum toxin injections uh, uh, to treat their um, cervical dystonia if it's very focal, um, with uh, some indications depending on which medication you're using within a certain age group. Um, the, in adults, the examination is key. If it's isolated focal cervical dystonia, most of the time you do not need an, an MRI of the brain if the rest of their neurological examination is normal and it's not part of a syndrome or, or other disease process. This is also similar to blepharospasm, the second cause of uh, focal dystonia, second most common cause of focal dystonia in adults. Uh, oftentimes it's a clinical diagnosis. And so botulinum toxin injections are first line treatment. There are adjunctive therapies as well, uh, which we can review. And so the first line, let's talk about botulinum toxin injection treatments. It is best tolerated. It is very effective. Um, and there are a number of uh, um, uh, injectable botulinum toxin that are approved in Canada. There are three, which we'll go over in the next slide. Um, these are uh, available and approved and, and covered by most insurance companies. And, uh, and patients under, covered Ontario, uh, in, under Ontario drug benefits, at least in my province of Ontario. Um, there are oral medications, and this covers broadly um, dystonia, but for focal dystonia, you know, the pharmacotherapy can be uh, um, associated with general lack of efficacy and, uh, and uh, side effects. The uh, physical therapy can be indicated as adjunctive therapy, but rarely improves function except when combined with botulinum toxin. So people always ask when they're first diagnosed with cervical dystonia, can they manage this through physical therapy? I'm gonna I, I have a slide on this, but I will jump ahead by just saying that by itself, it probably isn't enough, but in combination with botulinum toxin, yes, there's data that is quite promising. Surgery, and specifically deep brain stimulation surgery, similar to the same deep brain stimulation surgery that has been used for years in um, uh, advanced Parkinson's disease or advanced essential tremor um, or um, generalized dystonia. Um, and, and of course, in dystonia, it's a, it's a, it may be a different target. And some of the targets are actually very similar amongst these diseases, and, and that would be determined by your surgical center. Um, but it works quite quite well, but it is used because of the potential side effects and risks of a major brain surgery. This is, tends to be, I, I, I use this term as a last resort uh, for people with very severe or refractory, meaning not responding to other treatments like the injections. And so botulinum toxin treatment involves injections into the affected neck muscles. So one would imagine that you have to get the pattern right, especially earlier I mentioned many directions of movement can be involved as part of this. 
And so you need to identify the primary directions of movement and know which muscles as the expert who's doing the injections and the movement disorder specialist, um, uh, how to come up with a muscle selection and dosing pattern for those muscles, and as well as the, the uh, degree of severity might influence your, your dosing per muscle. Um, so these are direct intramuscular injections. Um, there are three types. There's Botox, which many of you uh, have uh, heard of. Uh, Xeomin, which was the second person on the market, second, second uh, uh, injectable on the market. And then there was Dysport, which was most recently approved in 2016 in Canada. The frequency of injections typically uh, are um, given every three months. There is the option amongst these medications for flexible dosing intervals. So um, some patients might wear off by 10 weeks, 10 to 12 weeks is what we say uh, on average, or is what I tell my patients where you may start to wear off. Um, but there are some people that need it as frequently as every six weeks. And the concern initially uh, by uh, very old studies when, when uh, were uh, that um, a more frequent dosing might lead to resistance because uh, the way Botox was developed initially that, uh, uh, and how it was formed might induce uh, um, an immune response. So complexing proteins in the Botox might cause an immune response that would uh, over time cause a secondary non-response. Now, I gotta say that Botox has modified their formulation and that clinically has not been a, a much of a problem uh, um, by experience, but that being said, it's still a, a theoretical risk. And if you were to check blood work from the uh, clinical trials, this is not commercially available to do, but in studies, they do show that after many years or the more frequent you get the injection shorter than the recommended interval of three months, let's say you're at higher risk of developing these um, neutralizing antibodies. And although we do capture them in the bloodstream, it does not necessarily, do, they don't always have clinical significance in terms of causing a non-response but it is uh, uh, in the back of our heads as a, a specialist who do see patients that have done well for years as to why they may not respond after some time. And there's ways of troubleshooting that. Um, and Xeomin uh, um, uh, has uh, come about by saying, well, they, they have the pure toxin of 150 kilodalton protein. That number may not be important, but that's the pure botulinum toxin that doesn't have the complex amino protein. So theoretically, they wouldn't have the neutralizing antibodies. And, that, and that's true from, from uh, uh, um, uh, testing of, of blood samples in terms of not seeing any neutralizing antibodies there. Again, clinically, uh, 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 that can be discussed with your uh, uh, movement disorder specialist. And then Dysport, it was our next uh, person on the market who state that uh, in, in many studies, and, and there is, this is backed by evidence, that they've seen people doing well even up to 16 or 20 weeks, so a bit longer duration of effect. Uh, now, they haven't gone head to head, and certainly there might be, um, some of my colleagues may, may tell you out there that there is experience that shows that, yeah, even with Botox or Xeomin, they might be able, some patients, some select patients may do better uh, uh, longer with injections every four months instead of every three months. And so um, there have been surveys done. Uh, Dystonia Canada ha have done, uh, um, have uh, performed surveys with patients on dystonia in general and what their experience was with uh, neurotoxin injection treatments. And uh, this, these are some of the numbers uh, that um, are very interesting to show everyone uh, because, you know, only 13% describe their dystonia as under good control. Now, again, this is broad. This is not just cervical dystonia. 38% uh, describe it as manageable, 24% troublesome, and 25% inconsistent, whatever that may mean. However, uh, this tells you that we still have work to do, and uh, there may be ways to further optimize treatment. And I'm going to speak to you as... Um, uh, to uh, treatment discontinuation. So why might patients discontinue treatment? So lack of benefit is quite obvious, treatment failure, side effects to medications, and injectable treatments, there can be potential side effects. And I'll, and I'll go through a few of those with you. So when you're injecting the neck muscles, there is the theoretical risk of neck muscle weakness, usually in the injected muscles, whatever muscles they might have injected, or the nearby muscles due to spread because it is a liquid. Now, the uh, doses used are carefully selected to try and minimize that. The other way of doing it is either uh, to minimize the side effect of, uh, of weakness 
uh, or uh, swallowing trouble, if you inject in, in one of the muscles that's too close to some of the swallowing muscles, would be to adjust where in that muscle you inject, how many injection sites you use, or concentrating the, uh, the, um, uh, the solution uh, of, the, um, of the botulinum toxin. Uh, inconvenience of repeat injections, you know, need a bit of needle phobia. Um, cost might be, might be a factor for some patients uh, who don't have insurance coverage um, or, do, or do not fall under Ontario drug benefits in, in our province. You know, patients over 65 would be covered. Um, under that, for as an example, um, improvement in the condition um, it might just remit, and and that's a small number, but that that could happen. Uh, and again, that's important to uh, it, that's why it's important to keep following up and reviewing, uh, even at the time you're due for your injections, if for the doctor before they they're ready to come at you with the needles because they you were scheduled for a, for an injection appointment to say. Actually, you know what? I'm pretty. I'm pretty good today. Maybe we can delay and review this in another month. That might be a way to uh, uh, see how you do. Or if it does come back, then maybe you need longer gaps in between injections instead of shorter gaps. Uh, relocation. What does that mean? Patients have moved, and they were lost to follow up, and they weren't able to get a. And, and, and we couldn't get this data uh, because patients have moved on and, and have not been able to resume their injections. Another cause of secondary non-response, again, lack of benefit, um, whereby patients used to respond very well to toxin but have less of a response, maybe due to longer gaps between treatment. They might not have a complete lot, lack of response, but they not, might not respond as well on the same dose used if they've waited, especially during COVID, as an example, um, because you couldn't get in to see your doctor because of restrictions in their clinic until we figured out the plan on how to bring in patients safely. Um, if you've gone six months now without an injection, but previously you were getting an injection every three months and that was working well for you, you're on the same dose and stable, when you go back, that dose, even though keeping it the same, might not respond as well. You, you might still get some response, so that might be a factor. And then you kind of have to play catch up a little bit. This is only one of a number of uh, potential factors that I just mentioned. So um, how do we optimize treatment outcomes and reasons for treatment failure? Well. You, you, you have to get the correct diagnosis. We talked about that. So does the person really have dystonia? Therefore, it, is botulinum toxin the right treatment? So cervical, dys, cervical dystonia relies on a clinical assessment, abnormal or involuntary postures, identification of specific characteristics, again, ruling out you know, other things. Uh, it's often misdiagnosed stress or psychological causes a, 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 that can play a role. Um, if, tre if there's a, mainly a tremor, uh, in, in the head. Is it essential tremor or is it dystonic tremor? We talked about that. The types and severity of symptoms can be variable. There's an, we don't have a laboratory test that can confirm. The MRI and, and uh, laboratory tests are often normal. Um, and so it is very important if your uh, family doctor or general neurologist is not sure to be sent to a movement disorder specialist. Um, searching for a treatable secondary cause, again, medications, taking away the neuroleptic medication. Uh, might be the first uh, uh, line therapy. Um, and then seeing how they do after uh, several months of being off that medication to see if things improve. Uh, what's the aim of the treatment is the other question to ask. What's your expectations when you're reporting treatment failure or um, displeasure or uh, 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 um, dissatisfaction with the treatment? Um, are we improving function? What's the posture of the head and neck? Are we trying to uh, target the pain? Um, is there a mechanical problem on top of the cervical dystonia, which I mentioned was a brain signal, but does the patient also have some degenerative arthritis of the neck that might be a totally separate issue? Or might it have been exacerbated by their head pulling for years in one direction because it got quite severe and they weren't injected? Then you might also have to treat the neck pain as you would other arthritic neck pain on top of getting the injections with the botulinum toxin. Again, the... Uh, 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 resistance to the medications uh, for a number of factors, uh, identifying the appropriate muscle and dose selection, uh, and, and then managing the non-motor symptoms. We're going to talk about that in, in, a, in the next slide, but how do we further optimize outcomes? And one way, so here are the ways we inject. First and foremost, you have to use anatomical landmarks no matter what. So we have to understand the anatomy. That you're, so your neurologist, your movement disorder specialist does know that and they're experiencing it. 
and they, they figured out what muscles they want to inject. But when they're putting the needle in, they may be just using anatomical landmarks to say, well, that's where the muscle is, two centimeters down, two centimeters to the left, and then a couple centimeters deep, right? To, especially with some of the deeper neck muscles. Well, one way, if you're not getting a good response, is to add EMG, electromyogram, where you're in with that same needle, the same one you're gonna inject with, but you get feedback and hearing the muscle that you're in, you hear a, 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 a muscle activity, pop, 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 sound, and you know you're in the muscle and you can even activate it in certain ways or just hear that it's overactive as part of your dystonia. Some people even use the EMG to diagnose, am I in a muscle that's actually active? And then they can, they can move the EMG needle around to different muscles to see what's active. Uh, but that's, you use the EMG to guide the injections. Ultrasound, using an ultrasound to see the anatomy is, is, might be a very helpful tool and that might improve your response as well. Um, and so you can think about where would we use this? So if you've done well without EMG, without ultrasound for years with your movement disorder specialist, but then after let's say 15 years of injections, uh, you're not getting the same response. So one thing would be to use this kind of approach. And over time with repeat injections, there can be shrinkage of the muscle, right? Because you're dampening down the signal of the nerve to release the chemical to cause the muscle to contract. And that muscle is not receiving the signal to contract. So what happens when we don't use the muscle? It atrophies, it shrinks, right? But because that signal from the brain is still giving some signal to that muscle, aberrantly, so abnormally, your muscle, your head is still gonna pull in that direction. Just because the muscle shrinks, it doesn't mean the dystonia goes away. It's still an active muscle, albeit smaller than it used to be. In the beginning, you get a big honking muscle that's pulling you in one direction because it's getting an extra workout. Now you're given botulinum toxin and it's shrinking. And so what can, ha what can happen with the shrinking? You still have to inject that muscle, but you can imagine that it's harder to target if it's a smaller target to hit with a little needle. So using the ultrasound with maybe with EMG might help better target that because you can actually see the muscle. And so, although again, dystonia is a movement disorder characterized by motor manifestations, non-motor symptoms are increasingly recognized as an important factor in, uh, in uh, and predictor of quality of life. Um, with the literature is limited, but I will present a little bit. In many cases, it's not clear whether the non-motor symptoms are a result of the dystonia itself, um, underlying abnormalities in brain function, um, medications. Is it part of the uh, person in general? So is it a, a, a predisposing condition or something that was already present in the person or is it part of the uh, package of the cervical dystonia? Uh, we know that in generalized dystonia syndromes, some of the genetic forms that our, our other colleagues talk, spoke to you about last week, uh, there can be non-motor symptoms associated with that as well. And in cervical dystonia, like on this side, 61% of patients with, um, presented lack of confidence uh, due to uh, st stigmatization. And that might be the physical appearance. So that's secondary. 59% um, had sleep problems, 51% fatigue, possibly due to those sleep problems directly or indirectly. Depression was quite high as well, as you can see, and this was the major determinant of um, uh, poor quality of life. Um, under stress, you may ask, does stress cause this? Well, if it's a true cervical dystonia, and how I've been describing it, stress didn't necessarily cause this directly, okay? But can stress exacerbate the symptoms as well as your response to treatments and therapy? Yes. Absolutely. And that happens with all movement disorders. So my patients who have Parkinson's disease and a tremor, for example, that do really well on their medications, but under stress, under infection, whenever they're sick, that's systemic stress. If they're not sleeping well, um, if they're ill for whatever other reason, um, if their mood is not well managed, absolutely their tremor can be worse. And it doesn't mean that their Parkinson's is progressing. And I use that just as an analogy not to make an association with this condition, but just to give you an idea that stress can exacerbate movement disorders. Um, same, with, same with tremor of any cause, okay? Uh, no correlation was found between age, duration of dystonia or its severity, as well as the duration of botulinum toxin treatment, which may indicate that mood disorders are primary but not secondary to the dystonia. So maybe that underlying susceptibility uh, and that's part of the dystonia package. Um, uh, so here's a, here's a, a table or, or a, a, a graphic that just kind of shows the combination of non-motor symptoms that can occur. 
Um, and these are the non-motor symptoms which we've highlighted. Um, there is an important, um, so there, was a, there, were, there were plenty of studies recently that show that a non-motor component uh, to primary dystonia is very similar to what might actually be causing the dystonia at first and foremost. Do you, if you guys recall, uh, if you all recall, I mentioned it includes, it includes abnormality in sensory and perceptual functions on where our head is in space and how that signal is the voluntary side is sent back and how to fine tune bringing our head back to neutral position. Were there, well, there are other sensory and perceptual functions um, that affect the neuropsychiatric cognitive and sleep domains that may also be affected, right? And so uh, a loss of inhibition on the overactivity to fine tune that area and that signal to fine tune it um, is, is problematic. There's a, there's a problem in the software there. So the loss of inhibition and pathologically increase what's called plasticity. Many of you have heard of how the brain changes itself, plasticity. And we're, we want increased plasticity after a stroke, for example, for other areas of the brain to adapt and compensate for the deficits we have so we can improve. And now we can use that arm again, right? But in dystonia, it's, it might not be due to structural problem, especially not primary cerebral dystonia. So our brain actually causes some increased uh, plasticity there, but not in a good way, right? And so um, that is something that um, we can measure or modify using other things like transcranial magnetic stimulation as an adjunct, which is being looked into, but we're very early with this. And if you go back to Dr. Miyasaki's talk, um, she, did, she did bring this up uh, in an earlier talk last week on dystonia and an introduction to uh, dystonias um, in general and what's new. Um, optimizing treatment outcomes, again, here's, some, uh, 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 here's a survey of how patients felt uh, dystonia was affecting their day-to-day -day life and activities, um, just to give you an idea. And this is Canadian data. Okay, I won't go through all the numbers, but that's there for you as well. And there again, anxiety and depression. And again, in some uh, cases, mood-related symptoms can be primary. Um, we don't know whether it's part of the dystonia as a disorder or the susceptibility of the patient to have an underlying mood disorder or secondary to the disability related to this dystonia, that social isolation we talked about, the embarrassment of having the head movement or inability to communicate with your peers and colleagues or attend a Zoom meeting without your, you know, uh, without uh, having to turn your body in order to look at a screen uh, as an example here that's very relevant in this day and age. Um, but it can uh, uh, certainly affect the outcome of the response to treatment and should be addressed. And, and it probably should be part of a team and it might be good to have input from the family physician or if the mood issues are very prominent and uh, you or your family member uh, are, are aware of these, um, it, it is good to get input from uh, a, a psychologist or a psychiatrist in some cases that might be helpful. Um, Non-motor symptoms of pain. Pain is one of the most common and disabling complaints. I explained why pain may occur uh, um, uh, earlier. Uh, studies show that it's as high as 75%. And um, here's, here's the good part of this is if, if it's primarily direct, uh, due to the movement issue, the dystonia itself, then the botulinum toxin injections, once you've optimized it, we've talked about ways to optimize it earlier. If you get it right, uh, then it do, the injections themselves do reduce pain associated with cervical dystonia. Um, adding physiotherapy to botulinum toxin uh, treatment may improve disability pain and prolong the effect of botulinum toxin injections. That was shown in a uh, literature review. Um, physiotherapy, um, including postural exercises, um, biofeedback training, relaxation have been studied, but additional higher quality studies and clinical trials are needed. Um, Non-invasive therapies uh, have been discussed by Dr. Miyasaki last week in her talk. Um, we don't have enough data at present, but, research, uh, uh, but case reports indicate some response, but not everyone responds. These are things like uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, where the investigator puts a magnet on your head, you hear a clicking sound as the magnetic field changes, as the investigator stimulates either the motor or the sensory cortex. Um, there's the repetitive stimulation, which causes a change, or, or there's a ways to just use it for diagnosis to see what is actually changing in a person with dystonia compared to, let's say, people who don't have dystonia, healthy controls as part of a study. Uh, so there's two ways to use transcranial magnetic stimulation. 
Transcranial direct current stimulation uses electrical impulses to cause stimulation to the brain based on the same technology as electroconvulsive therapy, but using less uh, significant uh, stimulation uh, than uh, uh, electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, Again, this has been, uh, and these have been uh, shown in other forms of uh, focal dystonia as well, uh, and in other conditions. Again, a lot of, this is research-based, so um, this is not something that you would necessarily get from your movement disorder specialist uh, now um, until we have more, more data from trials. Uh, but this was very promising here, a randomized study of botulinum toxin versus the toxin plus physiotherapy for treatment of cervical dystonia. Uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation was used just to measure change, not to cause, not to cause a change, not to stimulate uh, in that way. And it looked at that plasticity, that's why I mentioned that earlier, and showed that, very interestingly, uh, the patients that had the toxin with the physical therapy, doing home exercising, stretching, active range of motion, and isometric exercise of the neck muscles, who did it for 15 minutes daily, five days a week, did better than those who just got the injections themselves. Okay, the objective scores too, not just their perception, of their dystonia uh, uh, were, uh, were better, were improved, and that was significant. Um, and what, tr what the transcranial magnetic stimulation showed is that um, the... Um, uh, values looking at a paradigm that looks at the changes on the brain, that plasticity was very similar to healthy controls after doing the botulinum toxin with the physiotherapy after the end of their um, week, uh, their six week or so cycle. And so to conclude, cervical dystonia is the most common form of focal dystonia, most commonly presenting in adults. The cause is unknown or idiopathic. It is diagnosed clinically by your neurologist or movement disorder specialist, and an accurate diagnosis is critical in order to know how to treat it correctly. Um, and the first line treatment to improve cervical dystonia is botulinum toxin. Uh, treatment optimization to improve pr uh, patient satisfaction requires review of many factors as we've discussed earlier today, and non-motor symptoms are common and need to be uh, recognized and addressed. Thank you. And if we have time for questions, I'd be happy to answer some. Thanks a lot for that, Dr. Rizik. Um, that was a great presentation. <laughs> can you hear me okay? I can, yeah. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to move back to PowerPoint. Uh, can you see my PowerPoint presentation, Dr. Rizik? I cannot. Sorry. Um, okay. Well, um, I, I want to thank you, especially for addressing all of the questions that uh, um, you addressed throughout your presentations. I have a list of questions and I'm going and checking them off. That was uh, amazing. Um, you um, And thank you very much for elaborating on the diagnosis and um, one important question that uh, most patients have always asked uh, throughout the webinar series is the impact of physical therapy, which I think uh, you covered uh, well in your uh, presentation with uh, supporting data. So uh, thank you for that. I have a couple of questions that um, were shared during the presentation. I'm going to go to one. So a patient is asked if there's any relationship between spas I'm sorry. A patient has asked if there's any relationship between spasmodic dysphonia and cervical dystonia. If you can talk about that. Yeah, so if, if, you, if you recall earlier, I mentioned sometimes it could be segmental. So focal being the group in the neck, but it can also affect the segment adjacent to it. The throat muscles or the, what controls the vocal cords, which is what happens in spasmodic dysphonia right? Spasmodic dysphonia is dystonia of the vocal cord. So it affects, so patients might have the adductor dysphonia where the voice sounds very stra strained. Uh, I can't, I can't even do the impression, but, or they can have the ad abductor where they don't constrict, they don't come together, the vocal cords. And so uh, you can't alter a sound or phonation. So it sounds very, very breathy and soft. 
right? And so, yes, there, there has been uh, reports of associations with dystonia and absolutely it can co-occur. And can it be isolated? And, and in case, you, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure the patients are wondering, does that mean I'm developing something else down the road? Not necessarily. Okay, especially when it presents in, in adulthood. But yes, there can be an, an association. The same way I mentioned, you know, a limb can be dystonic with the head tremor as well, or the dystonic uh, a movement of the head. Well, you can certainly have a, have a spasmodic dysphonia with it. Now that being said, um, there are there are genetic forms that um, have dis, that of dystonia that have been identified that can have the uh, cervical dystonia as well as other body parts dystonia with a spasmodic dysphonia on top of that. Okay. That answers my follow-up question. Is the relationship between oromandibular dystonia and cervical dystonia? Thank it's you. A very similar answer. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. Um, so there is a question now. This uh, a couple of them. A couple of patients have asked this: um, Is how does cervical dystonia impact day-to-day -day living? And are there certain sensory tips or tricks to stop that or to help with that? You know that. Yeah, that's a great question. So in, in primary cervical dystonia, many patients, a large majority of patients, and, and if there are patients on the line, obviously I can't hear the, see the full panel here, but um, uh, you, may, you may know of the concept of a sensory trick. So many, many patients have already identified their sensory trick, right? So some patients may kind of hold, hold their hand on their chin. I, I have uh, some patients that might wear something around their neck like a, like a scarf, even in the summertime, just to keep their head steady. Um, biting on a, a pencil, you know, when they're, when they're speaking to someone. I mean, that's not practical, but, but it is something that they've noticed that their head movement might settle when they do, and that's, and that's very common. So using that concept, right, without having to bite on a pencil or touching your chin every time, I mean, some of them might be very practical tips that you're not bothered by, and you can certainly use every day, um, but it tells you something about that sensory motor feedback, right, and how we're almost tricking our brain into readjusting that signal. And so um, some of those uh, therapies with physiotherapy, some of the biofeedback therapy, some of those kind of play on that. So that's why it's really good that if you are gonna seek out a physiotherapist, again, we don't have much data, but as you can see, some of it's very promising, especially in, in, in uh, conjunction with the injections, which are first line. Um, if you find a physiotherapist that's familiar with dystonia, that is where I would go with that, right? Um, not, ev not every physiotherapist, you know, very, many of them are familiar with very common things, right? Um, post-stroke rehab and post-stroke related spasticity, but that's a very different condition than dystonia, right? So it, it'd be good. And I know, you know, some centers in Ontario, I don't know the centers out west or, or out east, but it might be good to look into that or ask your movement disorder specialist to say, do you know any physiotherapists that are comfortable with managing dystonia? Yeah. That's great. Thanks for that. That's one of the things that uh, at the DMRF Canada, we're hoping to um, um, provide uh, resources in the future. That's great. Yeah. Um, okay. I have. Um, so patient has said that um, why, why does her injected muscles ache for a couple of weeks after receiving um, botulinum toxin injections? Yeah, so, so that can happen. So injection site pain, bruising are, are the most common side effects that we talk about, that we mention with injections, botulinum toxin injections, in, for any reason, for, any, for anything we're treating with botulinum toxin. Um, and so uh, why, why does it hurt? Well, there, there's a no, there are a number of factors. Um, of course, there's swelling in the injected muscle. Right? There can be swelling because you know, there's, there's some needle passing through some muscle fibers. Oftentimes the needle is pretty small, so it doesn't cause as much trauma as you know, some other needles uh, can. Um, but you have to think of it another way. So your, your, your muscles are now constricted or contracted, I should say. They're overactive the whole time. Right? Now you're putting a needle into an already contracted muscle. Right? that causes a little bit more trauma than if the muscle was relaxed. Do you see what I mean? So it's, it's as if um, you had an injection in your bicep or your shoulder, let's say for a vaccination, for example, right? And you weren't relaxing your shoulder. You actually contracted, this is how you uh, activate a shoulder muscle by, by raising your shoulder. And you put it in the active muscle, that would hurt a lot more to put a needle into than if your shoulder was completely relaxed. Does that make sense? Yes. I guess that's the easiest answer in general of why it's painful to get a needle into a muscle. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
I have a question. Is there a possibility of um, the toxin leaking into glands that are close to the muscles injected? Um, so for the, for the most of the muscles that I would inject and I, and I feel my colleagues would inject for that, no, that would be, that would be a bit unusual. Yeah, so it doesn't usually spread to the glands. Um, uh, now, that being said, for other conditions, for other conditions we treat, such as in the face, right? Uh, when we're treating things like um, um, blepharospasm, not an issue because that's the eyelids. But there's a condition called hemifacial spasm where botulinum toxin is a treatment for, okay, uh, for, which, for which it's a treatment. Um, and sometimes, yeah, if you're, if you're not careful, you can certainly uh, um, uh, inject a, a nearby glands such as the salivary gland, what produces our saliva. That's possible and theoretical. And you can also in, you know, hit, a, hit a nerve in, in, the, in the face and cause some weakness temporarily. Um, most of the time, uh, it's temporary. Um, but, uh, but usually that'd be a bit unusual to spread the glands. I, I'm not quite sure if you're injecting a bit too far, but that's why um, using guidance is always helpful because then you know, it not only does it provide the doctor with reassurance, it provides you with reassurance too. I find my patients have told me that they, they like it better when we use the EMG because you can actually hear the muscle. Right, so it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's beneficial for all of us, the patient and the doctor, yeah. Thanks, thanks for sharing that, <laughs> that was very useful. Um, I'm gonna look at one last question. Um, a patient has asked, can it af affect a muscle around the heart? Uh, yeah, so you know that would, be, that would be very unusual. Not, 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 not. At least, at least not if you're done. If it's done correctly by a trained specialist in the neck, uh, I, I've never heard of that happening. Right. <laughs> I think uh, that's about all of the time we have for questions. Unfortunately, um, we've covered most of uh, our questions that were asked um, through your presentation. So once again, thank you for that. Um, I am just going to go due to my technology issues. I missed a slide, so I'm just going to go back to our. Uh, patient tools and resources. I, um, I wanted to remind um, everybody that we do have uh, support available, uh, uh, especially for those tuned in from the GTA and Ontario. Uh, Dr. Rizek has, uh, he, through his presentation, he also shared information about uh, the uh, drug coverage in Ontario. So uh, for those um, who would like to um, hear that once again, this recording will be available later, so we, uh, please do check that out. Um, as well, we have educational materials for patients. We have uh, the Real Patients Real Answers survey report, some of which uh, Dr. Brzezik used in his presentation. And uh, we have, a, there's a new patient to patient guide, uh, thanks to MERS Therapeutics. Um, it's a great guide, it's um, by patients for patients. It has uh, information on patient experience. Um, and we also have a dystonia lanyard that was recently launched um, that can be used as an aid or as an awareness tool, however you choose to use it. Um, we also have fitness videos by our dystonia ambassador, Casey Kitson. She's uh, released three exercise videos on stretching, core, and um, cardio. And, sorry. And we also have our COVID-19 questions answered survey. Um, that was conducted at the beginning of the pandemic. So please feel free to access all of these tools and resources on our website, www.dystoniacanada.org forward slash my dystonia. And um, just a note to everybody uh, that DMR of Canada is not recommending any course of treatment. Um, any new or experimental treatment mentioned today may still be relatively new or exploratory at this time. So a reminder to please speak with your movement disorder specialist about any course of treatment to ensure that it is right for you. Um, I want to thank, uh, take a moment to thank Mars Therapeutics for their very generous support of the entire My Dystonia and I webinar series, which has taken place throughout uh, uh, September uh, being Dystonia Awareness Month. And Again, a reminder, recordings of all of these webinars will be available uh, in October on our website. Uh, this is the last of the series uh, in English. We have one coming up in French on Wednesday. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to the entire webinar series uh, in English, of course, and 
thank you very much, Dr. Rizik, for uh, sharing your knowledge, especially your clinical experience, which was great. <laughs> thank you once again for taking the time uh, to present on dystonia. Thank you for having me. And stay safe, everyone. <laughs> Thanks. Have a great evening, everybody. <laughs>